Have you ever wondered why the left and right margins don't work as you expect? Especially now that we're transitioning from the elemental sections and columns to the containers. In this video, I'll explain why and I'll show you different ways you can walk around it. So stay tuned and let's get started. Before we talk about margins, we first need to understand the CSS box model. The CSS box model is a way of thinking about how elements are rendered on the page. Every element can be broken down into four parts. We have the content, the padding, the border, and the margin. The content is the actual text or the image that you see on the page. The padding is the space between the content and the border. The border can be seen as a wall, which is the line that surrounds the element. And finally, we have the margin, which is the space between the element and its neighbors. So here's a fun analogy that might help you understand the CSS box model a bit better. Imagine you're packing a present. The content of the present is the gift itself, like a PS5. The padding is the bubble wrap that you use to protect the gift. The border is the cardboard box that you put the gift in, while the margin is the space between the box and other presents on the shelf. Also, when calculating the size of the package for delivery, the size is usually calculated as the size of the entire packaging, not just the content itself. So similarly in web design, when we set the box sizing to border box, which is by default in all page builders, the width of an element is equal to the sum of the content, the padding, and the border. But that's not the total space taken up by the element. You also have to factor in the personal space around the element, which is the margin. So in summary, the width of an element is the sum of the size of the content, the padding, and the border. While the total space taken up by the element is equal to the sum of the width and the left and right margins. So for example, if we define the width of the element as 200 pixels, and then we define the left and right margin as 10 pixels each, then the final space occupied by the element is actually 220 pixels, not 200 pixels. That is one important thing you need to note. So now let's head over to the Elementor page and see how everything is in action. So here we are on our Elementor edit page. As you can see, this represents the illustration of the box model. So now let's go ahead and create a new section that will represent the body element or the parent section. I'll set it to full width and give it a width of 400 pixels so we can easily see it. Then I'll remove the gap as well as the padding. Finally, I'll give it a border to represent the boundaries of the element. So now that we have this, the next thing I'll drop in another container to represent the child element. For this, I'll set it to full width as well. Then I'll give it a background color. And finally, I'll give it a border. Then within this child element, I'll drop in a heading widget just to represent the content. So I'll set this is the content and I'll set it to center and the width to inline auto because by default, the content within a widget, this is just a representation. The content within a widget is usually set to auto by default. So now that we have this, now let's see how each of these elements interact with each other. That is the content, the padding, and the border, as well as the width. So let's just give the content a border as well, just so we can see how it interacts with the padding. So now let me just rename them to make it easy to remember. So I'll go back to the child element. Now watch what happens as we increase the padding. Like we said, 
the padding plus the automatic content plus the border will always give you the width of the element. So now let's see it in action. So under the advanced tab, let's start increasing the padding. You notice as the padding is increasing, what's happening? The padding is increasing, the content is shrinking, but the width remains the same. That's because, like I said, all three must equate to the width of the element. Since we already have a fixed width, so all three of them must try to combine to give you back that width. And since the content by default is an auto width, so it is basically taking up as much width as possible. But for the height, it's a bit different because the height of an element is usually set to auto. That means grow as much as you can. So that's why you see the height is expanding as we increase the padding, but the width remains the same. But now let's see what happens when we try to change the margin. So now let's go back. We're still on the child element. Now let's see how the margin interacts with the element. As you can see, as we increase the margin, watch what happens to the, the content is breaking out of its parent container. Why is that happening? Because, like I said, although the width of the element is fixed, the margin does not contribute to the width of the element, but it contributes to the space taken up by that element. So you see, this is the 79. Let's make it a round number. Let's say 50. So the left margin is 50 pixels. Then the element takes up 100% width. So that is 100% of the available space already given to it by the parent container. Then outside it is another 50 pixel margin, but we cannot see it because margin is just an invisible space that is surrounding an element. It's like cloaking the element. So that's why you have this breaking out. But then some people will now rightly point out that with the sections and columns, this was not how it happened. That even though you added margins, it was still not breaking out of the container. And that's for just one simple reason. If we remember when I go back to the parent container, while I was creating the parent container, if you go to the layout, you notice that I set the direction to the column. Watch what happens when I set it to row. See, the element immediately shrinks back to fit the available space. Because Flexbox, by default, they have flex shrink property. That means if there is not much available space, shrink your width to fit into that available space. But that only occurs in the main axis. It doesn't occur in the, the cross axis. So that's why it didn't work the first time. Because initially, it was set to a direction of column, which means the main axis is where the line is pointing to, was in the direction of the height. So it was allowed to shrink if there was no available space for the height at that point in time. But since the height was set to auto, that means it had available space, so that's why the height was increasing. If we had set the height to a fixed height, and then we had set the direction to column, then it would have been shrinking to fit into that available height. So now that we have that, you see the moment we change it back to the column, you see it breaks out again. But when we set it to row, it tries to shrink to fit into the available space. We can prove that it is using the flex shrink property by going to the child container. Under the advanced tab, if you see where it says size, you notice it has grow, there's shrink, and then there is custom. So let's say we don't want it to grow or shrink. So when you click the none, watch what happens. It goes back to overflowing from its parent container because by default, the flex shrink property is set to one. Because once we set it to shrink, see, it goes back to the parent container. And that is basically how it works. So that's why sometimes when you're working with the containers, it doesn't work out as you plan. Sometimes it works out. But when we're working with the sections and columns, because with the sections and columns, Elementor always set the direction to row. And then they did a kind of trick to make it look like it was going in the column direction, but it was actually set to row. But now they've taken away the training wheels from the whole thing and are giving us all the freedom we want to customize. That's why we can now see the flaws with CSS, how things interact with each other. So now we just have to learn that margin is the space outside of an element. And when there is not enough space, then the element has to break out to try to get space because by default, content should not be missing. That is how HTML was set up, that no content should be lost. Because you also notice with the content inside as well, that it's overflowing because it's not enough space available again to fit in the available content so it overflows to the edge of the screen.
but because the parent container has an available space from the padding, that's why it's just breaking out to the padding. Uh, that's the weird thing that happens. Containers always overflow. When there's not enough space, it has to overflow. And then where does it overflow to? It overflows to the right. If you're in the left to right direction of writing, if you're in the right to left direction of writing, then it overflow to the left. So now that we know all of these, what are the kind of things we can do? One way we can do it is set the parent container, just set the direction to row, and it will make it to shrink to fill the available space. But that only happens when there's only one element in the space. The moment you add in, let's duplicate this, a second element, it will overlap again because there's not available space. It only works when there is one element inside of the parent element. So now let's delete this. The other thing we can do is to go back to the child element and rather than setting the width to 100%, we instead set the width to be auto. That will give it the same effect as shrinking the parent container. So now let's go to the parent and change the direction. You see, no matter what direction we change it to, it will always shrink. It will shrink to what fill the available space. So that's the second option we can do. And if you see, if we duplicate it, this time, because there's no available space, it will wrap around to the second row. So this one works better. So if you want to have like equal spacing around the element, then set the width to auto instead of 200%. The other thing you can do is rather than setting the width, you can set the margins to auto and then set a fixed width to give you a similar effect. And then let's see how it works. So let's delete this item and let's now set the width. So this time, this is the child element again. So rather than setting the width to auto, we'll set it back to maybe 80%. And then we'll go to the advanced tab and we'll change the pad margins. So let's unlink it, use the pencil icon. And then now we'll set the left and the right margins to auto. And you see now again, it's back to normal. So basically it's creating the equal spacing on the left and the right of the content. So those are the different ways we can do it. You can either set the direction to row if it's only one element within that container, or you can set the width to auto, or you can set the margins to auto, the left and the right margins to auto. Those are the three major methods we can use, or you can just go to the parent container and rather than using margin on the child container, just go to the parent container and set the padding instead. So when you set the padding to the parent container, it also gives you the same effect as setting the margin to the child container. So those are the different methods you can use. There's something I forgot to mention, and that is that the widgets don't react the same way as the containers because the widgets still have the training wheels on. That is, they still have divs within divs and that is what is protecting them. So now let's duplicate this section. And then this time I'll delete the container inside and just add a simple widget. So let's see the text editor widget. Let's first remove the, the padding from the parent container. So now let's start increasing the margin of the widget itself. You notice that the widget actually stays within its container. That's because Elementor doesn't apply the margins for widgets to the outer container. It applies them to an inner div. And that is now giving it back the same effect like I explained from the beginning, whereby because it is set to row by default, so now it can expand as much as possible to fill in the entire space. If you found this video helpful, please consider liking the video, sharing it with your friends, and writing the comment section so that I know that the video helped you. And if you have any further questions, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you have a further explanation that I missed out in the video, please also leave it in the comment section below. I would love to hear them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.